Okay, so good morning everyone, and uh, well, it's a pleasure to see so many of you here today. So indeed, I'm going to, to talk about the growing use of uh, theorem provers in programming language research, and trying to explain why so many of us are in love with uh, theorem proving, basically. Um, uh, but let me start with some generalities first, uh, about what kind of supporting evidence you can give to your ideas. So you have a new idea in programming languages or any other area of science, uh, what evidence can you provide to support it? And in general, it's a combination of experimental evidence and mathematical evidence. So experimental evidence, for instance, if you can demonstrate actual impact of your idea in the software world, but that can take a very long time. Uh, garbage collection and automatic memory management took 30 years to become mainstream, so maybe you want to get your PhD before that. Um, so in general, it's more like controlled experiments, like you have a new uh, optimi optimization phase in the compiler, so you actually measure performance in a standard set of benchmarks and demonstrate some improvements. Or uh, case studies, for instance, you have a new verification tool and you run it on uh, some high profile piece of software like the OpenSSL security library, and if you find new unknown security bugs, uh, then that's strong evidence. And then the mathematical evidence is kind of complementary. Uh, first, well, the first thing is, are you able to give a mathematically precise description of your idea? If not, maybe something is wrong and you need to rethink your idea in more details. And then using this uh, mathematical description, can you prove some expected properties of your system? Maybe soundness, maybe completeness, maybe some complexity results. And uh, soundness is especially an obsession in, in the purple community. Uh, basically, we will forgive you if your system doesn't quite completely work or doesn't completely deliver, but uh, we will not forgive you if it, if it lies or if it gives, uh, you know, uh, wrong, uh, obviously wrong results. So if you have an algorithm, well, maybe it's just a semi-algorithm, it doesn't always dominate, but at least it should produce valid results. If you have a type system, maybe it doesn't accept that many programs, but at the very least it should reject programs that go wrong at one time. If you have a static analyzer, uh, uh, it must make predictions that, that actually hold for all program execution. If it says the analyzed program terminates, then the analyzed program has better terminate in all uh, executions. Or if you're doing a compiler optimization, maybe it's not improving performance that much, but at the very least it should preserve the meaning of programs and not change the meaning of your program, or not miscompile. And that's there's actually this great quote of uh, John Reynolds who has a uh, PhD committee of Alan Shivers. Uh, you wouldn't want us to give you a PhD for a buggy optimizer, would you? Um, so, um, and that leads to a bit of a tension in computer science, basically between elegant mathematics and uh, on the one hand and engineering on the other hand. So like poor Milu in this picture, you may be torn between on the one hand elegant and cluttered uh, mathematical abstractions where you can do nice mathematics and who could object to that, right? And on the other hand, uh, uh, doing things that are more uh, practical, more uh, closer to actual uh, uh, practice of programming and in general that leads to uh, artifacts that are a lot more complicated and sometimes overly detailed. And, and that's, uh, so, so quite, it's quite easy to fall in a vicious circle. So you start with a nice idea and you, your first formalization is simple. Okay, you, you, leave a, you leave aside a lot of details. So you get a simple formal system where you, you can do decent proofs and then that makes reviewers happy and they accept your paper. And then you feel more confident and so you want to make it more realistic and closer to actual programming practice. And you end up with a big complicated system uh, your proofs become ex excruciatingly long or fast and loose, like, okay, here are two interesting cases and the remaining 18 cases are similar, trust me. And then, well, reviewers are exhausted or even give up, just refuse to uh, examine your paper, and then what do you do? Um, and, well, so, so I love this, this quote of John Mitchell. So he quipped to me once that proofs written by computer scientists are boring because they read as if the author is programming the reader. And, but maybe that's the solution, actually. Who says the reader should be human, okay? Or, or maybe there can be two kinds of readers, human ones and computers. Maybe we can, enroll, uh, maybe we can have computer assistants to uh, check or maybe even develop some of those proofs. And that's what the theorem proving community has been telling us for decades, okay? And we only started to listen to them. And indeed, uh, these days in PL research, there are many uses uh, for theorem proving. So theorem proving is basically of two kinds. There's the automatic kind and the interactive kind. 
So the automatic kind, it's really, you know, this old dream of artificial intelligence in the 60s, the electronic brain that will put mathematicians out of their jobs. Uh, it's not quite like that, quite frankly. But there are some very, very good tools that appeared in the last 10, 15 years, like Z3, Vampire, Altergo, and that can solve a great many uh, mathematical problems, uh, generally in simple uh, logics, like first order logic. And those, uh, uh, those can be used in, in, in many tools related to programming languages, like in program provers to discharge the generated verification conditions. Uh, in, in type systems, as uh, Ranjit Jala will talk about uh, later today, I think. Or in static analyzers and related tools as some kind of generic solver. I mean, why, why develop a specific solver for your specific analysis when you can just re-express the problem into logic and call into Z3? So there's a great string of, of, of uh, analysis tools out of Microsoft Research that follows this approach. But what I'm going to talk most about today is interactive theorem provers. Uh, like Coq, Isabel, HOR. So here they give you much richer specification languages, uh, but, but they compromise on, on the automatic part. So the user, a human, actually writes uh, most of the proof. Um, and then the, 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 the tool will check it for correctness and uh, exhaustiveness. And for instance, those tools make it relatively easy to formalize uh, the semantics and, uh, of, of a programming language and use that, for instance, to verify specific programs. Uh, for instance, uh, the SEL4 uh, secure microkernel was formally, at NIC, was formally verified at NICTA uh, this way. So they developed their uh, program logic for, for C in uh, Isabel HOL and then used that to conduct the, 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 the proof of the microkernel. Uh, but once you formalize the programming language, you can also prove properties of all programs, like soundness of a type system or program logic, correctness of a program transformation, and that kind of things. Um, so let me give you a glimpse of uh, one of those interactive theorem provers, the Coq system, that I'm going to use in a demo in a second. Um, so it gives you a rich specification language called Galina that includes ordinary mathematics, you know, with, with the usual connectives uh, uh, and, and quantifiers, conjunction, implication, for all quantification. Uh, it also makes it possible to define recursive function definitions, pretty much like you do in Haskell or ML. So this is the... Uh, uh, definition of the length of a list as a recursive function. So fixed point means recursive function and pattern matching on the shape of the list. And then it gives you something called inductive predicates that are pretty close to inference rule, a popular formalism uh, to describe programming languages. Um, so, so to the left, you have a standard uh, inference rule, okay, with two premises and a conclusion that's a typing rule for application. And to the right, you have uh, uh, the corresponding inductive uh, uh, predicate in Coq. So it's a, a three-place uh, uh, relation, that, so something that produces something in prop, a proposition. And there's one case, one constructor for every rule, and written just as a logical implication. Uh, uh, premises imply conclusion. And then comes the proof part. So as I said, it's interactive. It's based on tactics, and that's how that's what I like to call the text adventure game because there's a lot of typing and a lot of backtracking going on. Uh, so, so at any time, the system displays the current goals that remains to be proved. And then the user types commands, tactics, that will either solve the current goal entirely or transform it into simpler sub-goals. So there's limited automation. Some types of goals, like involving only arithmetic or equational reasoning, can be solved automatically. And under the hood, as the proof gets developed, Kirk records it as a so-called proof term that is rechecked at the end for uh, correctness and, and uh, exhaustiveness. So you get some very high uh, confidence that uh, if the proof is accepted, it is correct. Okay, so for the demo, I'm going to show you a simple example of compiler verification. So basically, the idea is to prove that a compiler always generates machine code that implements the semantic of the source program, that no miscompilation occurs. And we are going to do that for a very simple source language and a very simple target language. So the source language is just arithmetic expressions. The target language is a stack calculator. For both languages, we are going to give abstract syntax and operational semantics. And we are going to define the compiler as a function from a, a source abstract syntax to target abstract syntax, and then prove uh, something that relates the semantics of the source and compiled code. All right, so let me switch to my other window. Uh, okay, is this big enough? Everyone can read? All right, let's go. 
Okay, so we start uh, by loading some libraries from the uh, Coq system. Uh, we are going to use lists and we are going to use arithmetic over integer type Z and the notations for Z. So this is the source language of arithmetic expression. So the abstract syntax, where we have a type of variable names that we don't quite specify. And then expressions are uh, just uh, uh, defined by case. So an expression is a constant carrying an integer n or a variable carrying a variable name v, or the sum, the difference, or the product of two sub-expressions. Right. And when I put that into Coq, basically it just type checks what I wrote, just like if you're using Haskell or Camel interactively. And for the semantics, we are going to give what is called a denotational semantics, but that's really just an evaluation function. Okay, so given an expression e, and an environment that associates values to variables, so integer values to variable names, uh, we are going to uh, explain what, what, what value, what integer the expression evaluates to, so that's a simple function definition uh, that proceeds by case analysis in the expression, right? If it's a constant n, the value is n. If it's a variable v, then the value is whatever you find in the environment associated with v. And if it's a sum, a difference, or a product, well, you recursively evaluate the sub-expressions and combine them with plus, minus, or times. So that's, that's pretty easy. Uh, now for the target language. So as I said, it's a stack machine in the style of uh, Hewlett-Packard calculators. So how many of you have used the Hewlett-Packard calculator in uh, reverse Polish notation mode? Okay, well, pretty good. <laughs> Um, okay, so, um, so this is instruction set. It has five instructions. When uh, push const will push an integer constant on the stack of the machine, push var will push the value of a variable on top of the stack, and then there are some arithmetic operations like add. So it's a stack machine, right? So the, the operands are popped off the stack and combined, like added, and the result is, is pushed back. So we have addition with two arguments. We have opposite, that just takes the opposite of the top of the stack, and multiplication. All right, so, uh, and then what is the code for this machine? It's just a list of instructions, right? So what kind of semantics are we going to give to that? Well, it's a machine, so machines execute one instruction at a time, right? And that changes their state. So the state of our machine is a triple. There's a code, list of instructions that remain to be executed. There's an environment giving values to variables, and there's a stack, which is just a list of integers, okay? So pushing on the stack, the top of the stack is the head of the list. And the transitions of the machine, so it's one of those inductive relations between the state before and the state after uh, the transition. And there are five possible transitions corresponding to the five possible instructions you can have at the beginning of the instruction sequence. So for instance, if your instruction sequence starts with a push const n, and in some environment and some stack, then in one execution step, you transition to code C, where the instruction push const n uh, was consumed, the same environment, and the stack with n uh, being, being pushed on top of it. Uh, for a push var, it's similar. It's only that you push the uh, value n of v. And for add, for instance, well, you, you need at least two things at the top of the stack, and two and one, okay? And then you replace them by their, their sum. All right, so you have those five transitions that correspond to execution of one instruction. And then to, to, to say what it means to, to run a piece of code, then we need to express zero, one, or several transitions, right? And that's technically, that's a reflexive transitive closure of our transition relation, which we can define also inductively. So star is either zero uh, applications of R, a relation R, or one application of R, or some transitions then followed by some other tran transitions. And so star transition is a relation between states that represents zero when our several successive machine transitions. And we can express now what it means for a, a, a machine to run successfully a piece of code. Uh, basically, you start the machine in a state that has this code, the given environment and an empty stack. And uh, you try to execute all instructions. And if you, in the end, uh, the code is empty, uh, you have the same environment, and at the top of the stack, you should have exactly one integer, which is a result that you expect. So this is a successful run of a code, and many pieces of code don't run successfully, okay? There's plenty of reasons for the machine to block. For instance, if you do an add on an empty stack, okay, it's just not going to make any transition. 
All right, so, uh, so now we have our two languages, uh, source and, and target language, so it's time to do some compilation. So how do you compile an arithmetic expression to machine code? Well, the idea is you, you generate some instructions that are good enough to uh, compute the value of the expression and leave that at the top of the stack. So that's the familiar translation to reverse Polish notation, with what you do in your head when you use those HP calculators, right? Instead of one plus two, in your head you know how you compile that to one enter two plus. And that's exactly what this function, recursive function is doing for, uh, by case analysis over the expression E. So for a constant we, expression, we generate a push const instruction. For a variable, we generate a push var. And the interesting case is for a compound uh, expressions like some E1 in two, where we generate some code to evaluate E1. Then we concatenate it, plus plus is this concatenation, with a code that generates, that will evaluate E2, and then we combine the result with an add instruction. And the only tricky point is that the machine doesn't have a subtraction instruction, so we emulate that by taking the opposite of the second argument and adding it to the first. All right, so that's our compilation scheme. And actually, we can, we can test it. So those function definitions, like this compilation scheme, are executable. So you can execute that within Calc. There's this compute uh, uh, thing that says, OK, tell me what is the compiled code for the expression uh, vx times vx plus 1. And so it evaluates it, just like uh, Haskell or Camel top level does. Uh, but there's also a possibility to generate automatically uh, executable code in, f in functional languages like OCaml, Haskell, or Scheme. Okay. So here, sorry, it's pretty big, but uh, so basically this is uh, camel code uh, for our function and for all the dependencies. All right, so you can execute and test your compiler, and now uh, we'd like to prove something about it. And so basically what we would like to prove is this statement uh, that uh, for any expression, if you take its compiled code, compile x per e, uh, then, uh, and run the machine on that, then the machine will run successfully and will not crash or block on things like an empty stack. And eventually at the end, uh, there will be the value of the expression E at the top of your stack. Okay. And, oh, this is a little small. So, I've just stated that and now Cog tells me, okay, this is the current goal, up to you. And, and actually, if I try to prove that directly by like case analysis of E and whatever, I'm not going to do it. So let me just abort. And I actually need to show something a little stronger uh, to strengthen my, my lemma so that uh, it will work also for the uh, evaluation of sub-expressions. So, so what you really want to prove is that if you, if you have the machine in this state, the compiled code for E followed by some code C, some environment, some stack, then the machine can make zero, one, or several transitions uh, to code C. So all the instructions uh, generated by CompileXper have been com computed. The same environment and the same stack, except that now you have the value of E at the top of the stack. Okay, and that's the good uh, uh, statement that you can prove by induction and case analysis over your expression. So these are my first tactics. I'm telling it to do an induction and case analysis at E, then uh, introduce the other variables and do some uh, simplifications. And I'm left with five cases uh, corresponding to the five uh, shapes, uh, five forms of expressions, right? So this is the first case that corresponds to a constant expression. And that one is pretty easy because if you look at it, uh, I can get that by exactly one transition, which is the execution of the push const uh, instruction. And so, okay, four sub-goals that remain. So the second one is for uh, variables. That's another base case that can be solved uh, just by doing one transition of the push bar kind. And now comes the uh, slightly more involved uh, cases uh, about uh, compound expressions. So here, uh, since I'm doing an induction, Koch is giving me, as hypothesis, the result I want to show, specialized for my two sub-expressions, E1 and E2. And so now, basically, I'm can, I can take advantage of that by noticing that uh, uh, the first induction hypothesis tells me something about executing code that starts with compile per E1, and I have some code like that. So I can do some transitions that will compute, consume the code for E1, 
and leave me in this intermediate state. And then I can do some more transitions by using the second induction hypothesis that will compute the code for, consume, execute the code for E2. And in the end, I only have to do a add instruction, and I'm done. And so the other cases are kind of similar. Uh, well, except that for subtraction, at some point, I have to do a little bit of arithmetic reasoning to tell Kirk that uh, x minus y is the same thing as x plus opposite of y, which is pure arithmetic reasoning, and then it works. OK, so yeah, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm not going uh, in full detail on this proof. Uh, and then the original correctness statement is a corollary. You just specialize a little bit the recursive lemma, and you're done. And the last thing I wanted to uh, uh, draw your attention on is that, um, so this proof is kind of repetitive. I mean, in retrospect, we see that many cases are similar, and, uh, but that's normal. I mean, in the, here we were just exploring the problem for the first time. Uh, and then, uh, uh, but a posteriori, you can put some more uh, automation to, the, to work, in particular by telling Kirk that, as a hint, that maybe uh, it could use the constructors for the inductive relations transition and star. And then, just by hinting, uh, using the EOTO tactic, I can solve five, uh, four of the five goals automatically. Okay, so here I'm just left with one case. Whoops. What? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 that's good. It's just that my screen is a little too short. Okay, so here everything is solved except the case for subtraction uh, because, uh, well, there's this little bit of arithmetic reasoning that still needs to be performed by hand, okay? Minus is plus opposite. And then I can finish by uh, a fully automatic proof. So now it looks a lot better and it's probably more resilient if I extend my languages afterwards. All right, so that was the 10-minute uh, demo. Oops, sorry. That's what you want to see. And, uh, uh, and actually what we just did, oh, okay. What we just did is actually the complete mechanization of a seminal paper by uh, John McCarthy and James Painter. It was the first paper that introduced the idea that there is something to be proved mathematically about the correctness of compilers. So it feels good to uh, be able to do that on machine in, in a fairly short development. So in my uh, remaining five minutes, uh, just uh, let me tell you a few words about, uh, well, give you uh, some examples of notable projects in programming languages that use interactive theorem provers. There are many others, okay? These are just representative examples. So I already mentioned the LCL4 LCL verified microkernel as an example of use in, in the area of, micro of uh, verification of systems code. There's also the Certicos uh, project at, at Yale, which is, uh, uh, has similar goals. Uh, on the programming language formalization form, there's uh, Jinja at Munich, which is a fairly complete formalization of Java Lite, uh, a subset of the Java language, the Java virtual machine, the Java concurrency model, the soundness as a bytecode verifier, and the correctness of a compiler from Java Lite to JVM. Uh, on the compiler verification front, I should mention my own uh, concert project, which is pretty much like the demo, except it's a much more complicated compiler. It's about 15 passes with optimizations that treat most of the NCC language and produces code for uh, real-world processors. Uh, on the uh, type soundness front, uh, there's been uh, uh, some great work by uh, uh, Harper and, and, and Curry at CMU on the meta theory of standard ML. Meta theory in this context basically means proofs of type soundness. Uh, the Popple Mark Challenge that was initiated at UPenn about 10 years ago was about comparing interactive time provers and formalization styles on a simpler meta theory problem, that of uh, the uh, F sub uh, calculus. The uh, verified software toolchain at Princeton is a great example of a, a program logic. It's a concurrent separation logic for C that is embedded uh, and, and usable from within the Coq proof assistant. And then I should mention the heroic effort at Imperial at Inria to formalize JavaScript and uh, develop program logics and certified analysis for it. Okay, but uh, I think this also goes with, with a change in programming language research practices. So, so that was the opening statement of the uh, Popple Mark Challenge about 11 years ago. How close are we to a world where every paper on programming languages is accompanied by an electronic appendix with machine check proofs? And we are even 11 years later, we are on our way. So I estimate about 20% of the Popple papers uh, uh, come with such an electronic appendix. And well, this has some obvious benefits that we already mentioned. We get stronger, more trustworthy results, and we can attack bigger, more realistic formalizations without compromising on mathematical quality, uh, which is good. And then there are some less obvious uh, benefits. For instance, having 
a, a mechanized proof, a mechanized development makes papers crisper, easier to read for the reader because there are fewer proof details to be taken care of, but also easier to write for you. Okay, because you don't have to detail all the proof, you just have to tell a good story on your proof, and that's much more pleasant. Also, it gives a second chance to students and even academics and even faculty who uh, are not completely confident in their ability to write good mathematical proofs because, well, you know, the proof assistant is infinitely patient and it doesn't judge and it never gets angry, unlike reviewers and advisors, okay? Uh, there are some downsides too, so uh, interactive uh, theorem proving can be very time consuming, uh, it's even worse than programming, and somewhat addictive too. Um, and then uh, as, as we develop bigger and bigger uh, uh, proofs and machine, we run into proof engineering issues, just like you know when you develop bigger and bigger programs, you run into software engineering issues. Only, well, for software we have more experience. Okay, if you want to uh, learn more about, uh, inter uh, about theorem proving, uh, interactive theorem proving, uh, you, uh, I recommend the Software Foundations te electronic textbook by Benjamin Pierce et al. So it really teaches uh, the Coq system and how to use it for basic logic, for basic functional programming, and for, uh, 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 for formalizing and reasoning about programming languages. And it's all executable as a Coq development, which is pretty cool. So in closing, I think uh, judicious use of automatic or interactive theorem provers can take your programming language research to new heights. So go forth and make a noise. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, OK. Okay, the question is, uh, is about uh, hints. Uh, so what does hint constructors transition star means? Well, it means to Kirk that uh, when I'm invoking the E-auto, yeah, maybe I should say a few words about the auto and E-auto tactics. So basically E-auto and auto is just try to solve the goal by applying repeatedly uh, all the theorems you know in your uh, hint database, okay? And so it's like prolog, you know, executing things in prolog. And so here I'm just adding stuff to this database, okay, saying that, okay, the, the constructor for transition, the, the five uh, uh, rules for executing the five instructions, and the constructors for star should be considered by EOTO. And then uh, that's enough to uh, solve uh, most of the goals. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, the, the, the question is um, basically, and what if the reader is actually interested in the details of the proof? Okay. Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, I think, well, when, when I do a proof on machine uh, uh, and then I write a paper about it, Basically, I use the, 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 the mechanized uh, uh, proof to uh, pick out the key definitions and the key lemmas and the, uh, you know, the, the high-level steps of the proof. So I'm still hoping that someone can just, by reading the paper, reconstruct uh, the proof or, or see uh, what are the important insights. And if that doesn't work, well, I'm also going to give you my proof script, okay? So you can also uh, replay it interactively. Okay. It's hard to read a proof script, but it's easy to replay it and see uh, uh, what, what goes on at, at every proof step. So that's another way to see what's going on at a really low level. But most of the time, the kind of high-level overview you can give just by, by stating the key invariants and the key lemmas is good enough. Phil? There are some truths on, uh, on that. Um, well, for the four-color theorems, at least, I think that the mathematicians 
were able to understand the, 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 the general economy of the proof. It's just that they found it ugly because of so many special cases and so many cases that they had to be uh, checked by machine. Um, so um, maybe there's a little bit of difference here between real mathematicians and us computer scientists, <laughs> which is that they care more about proof elegance and, and beauty and than us. And probably we care more about just, you know, uh, less so, I believe. But well, yeah, there, there's a continuum. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a very good answer to that. Uh, but certainly, once you have your mechanized proof, you can also kind of, you know, reconstruct it and explain it in usual mathematical terms and see if it is pretty or not. Uh, Uh huh. Use, yeah. Okay. Okay. No, fair enough. Fair enough. More questions? Yes. Sure. Oh. Oh. So, absolutely known. Uh, from, from the standpoint of the system is just uh, kind of a convention. Uh, uh, so yeah, there are theorem, lemma, corollary, and a few others. Um, and, and basically, uh, what I'm trying to imply here, but that's my, just my style. So lemma is kind of an intermediate uh, 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 proof uh, step, uh, usually, but an important one, when, when that has some meaning. And, uh, uh, and theorem is the final thing. I, I wanted to, to show. Uh, but that's just a convention. Oh, yeah, there's also remark. So you can make remarks. In code. But they, they are all equivalent from, from the logical standpoint. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes? Ah. Mm hmm. Uh, okay, yeah, so the question is, is the theorem prover uh, consistent? And when he says okay, is this really a good proof? Um, so you write that uh, about once every two years, uh, someone finds a new way to prove false uh, uh, in COG, um, and that is quickly patched. Um, um, so yeah, the confidence is not absolute. Uh, I would argue, actually, I think it's an argument by Thomas Hales, who's a mathematician who's very much into theorem proving, that uh, uh, the risk here of getting a wrong proof accepted is much, much lower uh, by several orders of magnitude than the risk of, of getting a wrong paper proof accepted by reviewers. So you're still gaining several orders of magnitude in confidence. Uh, but yes, that also means we should be extremely careful about the quality of those uh, proof assistants, and uh, we should be ready to rerun old proofs with new versions of the proof assistant. Maybe we should have independent implementations of the same logic, uh, those kind of things. Yes. Okay, I think we'll take a break. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.